It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? I trust that you feel that way. Today we're going to be examining God's word, as if you didn't know. And we'll be in the epistle of Paul. And he's writing that to the Christians who are in the city of Ephesus. We'll be uh, in chapter 3, right at the very end of chapter 3, covering verses 14 to 21. The message today really displays for us uh, the Apostle Paul encouraging the Ephesians and indirectly encouraging us as we pause to think about how we address God in prayer. If I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to stand to do so for the reading of God's word today. This is Ephesians chapter 3. And never forget, folks, never ever forget what you and I are speaking about this morning is the very word of God, preserved for us, transmitted through the centuries so that we might hear it and read it right now in the 21st century. Paul the Apostle wrote this letter to the Christians in Ephesus. We begin at verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And at this point, uh, I want to point out that Paul takes us on a 13-verse parenthesis. Uh, he comes out of that parenthesis as we begin our text for today at verse 14. So now that I've told you that, let's start again over. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, indeed, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, Paul says, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery is, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore I ask you, not to become discouraged about my tribulations in your behalf, since they are your glory. And now let's continue to the verses for today. And we kind of pick up with the same words that Paul started this chapter with, for this reason. And now Paul is back to his main emphasis on prayer. For this reason... I bend my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner self, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thus far are the words of today's Holy Scripture. You may be seated. I want to recall to your mind the words of Isaiah. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, that will last forever. And that's what we're looking at today. Just as Jesus said it in his day, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Allow me to lead us to the Lord in prayer then. Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight because as your psalmist says, Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. God, we do pray that your word would be meaningful to us today, that we would see avenues in our own lives where we could implement your word, where we could interject your word for the betterment so that we might grow in spiritual maturity and Christ-likeness. For it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Do you remember uh, several weeks ago, I'm sure you all remember this, several weeks ago when I mentioned FOMO, F-O-M-O, the fear of missing out. And it seems that many people in our culture really do have this fear of missing out. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about that as well. There was a time when I pastored a church in uh, Florida and I wrestled with uh, whether to own a cell phone or not. I liked the time alone. Uh, time that I could spend uh, in the car just driving or jogging from the church to my home. I liked not being able to be tracked down. The elders in the church didn't share my enthusiasm for that. Uh, but suppose that I didn't want to get that phone. And suppose also that uh, a distant aunt of mine in the Barbados was wanting to leave me her 50-room mansion. Or suppose that you are single and your first love is desperately trying to reach you to see if you're still available. Uh, but of course... Uh, Without the phone or Facebook, you'll never know what could have been yours. Well, Paul wants his hearers in Ephesus to know exactly what is theirs. And so he prays for them. Look with me in your sermon outline there, and you see the beginning of verse 1. And then where Paul picks up, Next, uh, in that thought, as he continues on in that thought, all the way in verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. He's saying to these people, you need to know all that is available to you, all that is possible to you. Uh, this is right at the crossover between Paul telling the Ephesians all that is theirs and the next three chapters where he tells them, here's what you must therefore do. So let's look a little closer at our verses for today's message, verses 14 to 21, in the context of the earlier portion as well. Now to verse one once more. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit." To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel for which I was made a minister 
according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery is, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore I ask you not to become discouraged about my tribulations in your behalf, since they are your glory. And today... Let's read our new section, beginning in verse 14 and going to the end of the chapter. And we pick up with the same words that he started in with verse 1, for this reason. Now Paul is back to his main point, his main emphasis on prayer. For this reason, I bend my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, so that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and height and depth. In other words, so that you may understand all that is yours." and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Last Lord's Day, we touched a bit on prayer. Today, I've put those two boxes in your sermon outline again to show you how all this dovetails together with James 5.16. That verse says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. In other words, the prayers of a righteous man are powerful. The prayers of a righteous man are effective you can see that the prayer is actually like a supplication. The Greek word here is deasis, and that's an asking, a wanting, a need, an entreaty. It's a request. So let's tackle the givens of supplications. In other words, the givens of our askings. Because sometimes... James also tells us that we have not because we ask not. And we don't want that to be the case. We are to do as Paul does. We are to bow before the Father. Look at what he says. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Going to the Father with prayers and askings is what we're seeing here. When we pray, do we really know who it is that we are talking to? The hearer of our prayers, friends, the hearer of our prayers, let me say that one more time, the hearer of our prayers is not the Virgin Mary. Nor is it a priest. We bow our knees before God. Well, in verse 15, we see the reason that we appeal to him. Our text says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. The word for family, incidentally, is actually patria. And you know, you can hear that as a cognate right away. Patria, well, we're talking about patriarch. Yeah, yeah. The, the word most frequently refers to uh, a concrete group. Uh, descendants, in other words, from the same father. We're talking about 
my fatherness. We're talking about fatherhood. Uh, we're in a relationship, in other words. That's why we pray to him. We pray to the creator. We pray to the God whose plan was to send his most cherished possession, Jesus Christ. After all, he taught his apostles the Lord's Prayer, which really we should call the disciples' pattern of prayer. And how does it start out? Our Father. So what are the givens? We must speak to the hearer. And we must be in a relationship with him. And the nature of our supplications, what can we discover there? We are to go before him with specific requests. Notice verse 16. We are to pray that he would grant you to be strengthened with power in the inner man. That's a purpose or a result clause in the Greek, which indicates that God knows what he's doing and he wants to show it to others. The vehicle for all this is the Holy Spirit who empowers believers to follow the master. He wants your Christian character to be strengthened with power. He wants his children to have exemplary integrity. He wants those in his family to be guided by his principles. He wants them to understand the moral reason why, and not just the what, but the why. So let's look closely at the ask in verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ must be present. Christ must be real in our lives. And then we remember, folks, remember, remember, please. Uh, this is a religion that we're talking about of grace and not of works. But I want to let you know that works do count. They really do count. As a matter of fact, I often say good works are not conditions for salvation, but they are certainly characteristic of it. So what is God up to? Why is all this so beneficial? Well, Paul tells us in verse 18, so that we may be able to comprehend with all the rest of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. In other words, all that God has in store for us. And also, not just comprehend, but so that we may know, and here the word is that we may know experientially, not just theoretically, but experientially, that we may know experientially the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge. And what might be the desired outcome of our supplications? Well, there in the latter part of verse 19, we read clear as day that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So therefore, with all the saints, we are to comprehend what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth. And then we are to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. Here's what we must know and be aware of. We are in a battle. We must be prepared to put on our armor, the armor that God has given to us. We need to make sure that we are enlisted and prepared in the Lord's army. Really, we ought to adopt the motto of the army. I don't know whether they still have it, but they had it years ago. Be all you can be. That's what Paul is telling these Christians in Ephesus. Be all you can be. Paul sees it. God certainly sees it. Now it's up to us 
to step out in faith and begin to pay back with gratitude for all that he has done in saving us. And a reminder in our supplications, let's remember what really is almost a doxology, certainly it's a benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In other words, lean on him. He is able. Well, how might we apply this message? Well, let's ask first, what am I doing in my prayers and supplications right now? And is there something that needs to change? Maybe it's your perspective. Maybe it's just obvious to you. There was an architect in England named Christopher Wren. He was constructing a very uh, famous, uh, large uh, cathedral. And uh, one day he walked around, he saw the three guys working there. And he asked the fellow, what do you think you're doing here? And he said, I'm quarrying rocks. And he went to a second guy and he said, now what do you think you're doing here? And he said, I'm building a wall. And the third fellow, he said, I'm constructing a cathedral to the glory of God. Sometimes we don't think about what we're doing here. This is critical. In 2 Kings 7, there's a story that that I I kind of like it. I love it. I love it. And the characters in it are Elijah, the prophet. And then there's Ben-Hadad, Uh, the bad guy, and he has his entire army there from Syria. And then there are these four lepers who are just sitting around the the gated gated community. And what's happening there is that Ben-Hadad is starving out the city. He's just strangling them. And in the chapter before, we hear prophecies from Elijah that says, you know, a donkey's head is going to be very expensive. And there are these uh, two women who uh, one kills her child so that she can continue to live. And now the next one is supposed to kill her child and she doesn't do it. It's a, it's a terrible scene. Well, uh, these lepers are sitting there at the gate and they look at the whole situation and they say, you know, if we stay here, we'll starve out just like the people who are inside the gates. So that's not a good place for us to be. Well, maybe we should go over to the Syrian army and, and if they kill us, they kill us, but it's, uh, it's not going to change. So uh, they decide to go over there to the campgrounds of the Syrian army and guess what? There's nobody there. Absolutely nobody there. But they've left everything in place. And the lepers thought, whoa, Look at all this food. Look at this gold. Look at everything here. We can hoard all this stuff out. I'm sure they went and tried to bury it along the way. Well, then, and only then, did they say, you know, maybe we should tell the people inside the city what we found here. This is critical. We need to avoid two great Christian tragedies that have been happening today, all the way down from there. The first one is not recognizing what God has already done for us. In the case of those lepers, there was no army left. There was no enemy left. So not recognizing what God has already done in our lives is critical, and that's what Paul is praying about. And then not sharing all that God has done already. Not sharing all that God has done already. So here are two areas where, well, we want Paul to keep on praying for us, don't we? And we should be praying that prayer as well.
Amen. Let me close us in prayer. Dear God, thank you that uh, Paul was so obvious in uh, what he was doing for because he knew where he had come from. And Lord, he always considered himself to be the, the least of the saints and eventually the greatest of sinners, he would call himself. Because he knew that apart from you, none of his salvation could have happened. Each one of us, Lord, that know you, we know the same thing. So God, we pray that you would uh, use us in sharing the good news. You would use us in, in recognizing what you've already done in our lives. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.